So welcome back for more physiology. What we're going to deal with is the spinal cord and how pathways move around inside of your body. So we're going to look for some patterns between different parts of spinal cord. So from once upon a time ago, what we dealt, started dealing with was reflexes. And we dealt with this with muscles. And what we noticed is there were five parts. So we had some type of receptor. We had a sensory neuron or an afferent neuron, an interneuron or the processor, a motor neuron or an efferent neuron, and then we had an effector. When we look at all of this, the point of a reflex, outside of keeping you safe, is to look for, or as testing reflexes, to see is there damage somewhere. And the more that we look, then we start to see some patterns of damage and anatomy of the spinal cord. So it might be helpful if we take that bit and we start to apply it to some anatomy of the spinal cord. For, of course, that starts with nervous system. We need to talk nervous system again. And we can divide up into two portions. So we can either have the central nervous system or we can have the peripheral nervous system. Those tell you location. That's pretty easy. But if you're asked, so what do each of those parts do? That becomes a bit more complicated. There are parts that you actually have control over and we have parts that we have no control over. So we have somatic areas, so I have conscious control, and I have areas that are autonomic or automatic. I have no control over them. So when we look at the nervous system, I can either divide up by anatomy, in which case I don't know what the parts do, or I could do it based upon physiology, which is I know what the parts will do, I just couldn't tell you where they are. So there's lots of confusion that comes with the, with the nervous system, and that's because it's complicated. So if we start zooming in just on the spinal cord, because that's going to be the easiest part, what I happen to notice is it starts right at the base of your brain, so at, right after the medulla, and it's going to continue down to somewhere around L1. And as it moves from the, the attachment to your brain to L1 or so, the spinal cord is progressively going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. We'll have nerves that pop off of there, but for the most part, it actually gets smaller in size until eventually you end with a cone, that we call the conus medullaris, which is going to be right here in the photo at the very end. And after that, you just get a bunch of nerves that kind of spread out all over the place that we call the cauda equina. So when I look at this, we start from big, we go small. Got it. What does that tell us? The spinal cord ends at some point. So if I wanted to test for the area around the spinal cord, there are smarter places to check and there are worse places to check. Bad place to check would probably be your neck. Good place would probably be down near your hips because we don't have spinal cord there. I also happen to have two areas where the spinal cord actually gets bigger instead of smaller as we descend and those are called enlargements. One of them is going to be the cervical enlargement. Reason for the cervical enlargement would be that's where the nerves for your arms pop out. We also have the lumbosacral enlargement which would be where you get a whole bunch of nerves for your ability to move around. So when we look at the spinal cord, the basic structure is pretty simple, but when we slice it open, it gets a bit more complicated. So when we put the spinal cord inside of the vertebrae, what we happen to notice is there's two different colors in there. So there's a gray color and then there's a cream color. And the way that it's always drawn is placed so that the bottom portion of the spinal cord, the anterior side, or what we'll now refer to as the ventral side, is the side that's going towards the vertebral body. And the side that's the back of the spinal cord, the posterior side, what we're now going to call the dorsal side, is going to be near where you turn out to happen to have the spinous process. So the little bumps that you have along your back. Why point that out? Because when we start drawing these things, it helps if we have an orientation as to where things are. Nerves move back and forth, and they always seem to originate from this dark colored portion, either in your brain or in your spinal cord. And when we look at that, that gray part turns out to correlate to part of a neuron, and then we have white parts that correlate to other parts of neurons. And we give those things names, gray matter and white matter. If I look at the brain and spinal cord, the two are opposite. So I have gray matter in the outside of the brain, what we call the cortex, and it's in the middle of the spinal cord. White matter turns out to be in the middle of the brain or the outside of the spinal cord. 
if I happen to look, there's a lot of surface area on the brain where it's near that cortex where the gray matter is, which means there's something important going on there. So when I start zooming in, what I notice is the white matter is associated with myelin. Myelin is fat, and fat actually is a cream color, or if you had to make it simple and not say the word cream, it looks more whitish than anything else, so we call it white matter. White matter is where we happen to have axons and the myelin sheaths around it. So whenever I look at a brain or a spinal cord and I see white matter, all of that turns out to be our axons, which means gray matter turns out to be made out of cell bodies. The cell body is the part of the neuron that does the processing. So if information dumps into a neuron, you know, 200 different synapses for that cell body, it's the cell body that collects all that information and spits out one response. It's the decision maker. And you happen to notice that that's in gray matter, which is found on the outside, the cortex of the brain, where we also turn out to have a lot of surface area. So clearly the brain happens to have a lot of processing power. So all of that said, we have gray matter, we have white matter, white matter is made out of axons and myelin, gray matter turns out to be made out of cell bodies. If I look at how information flows up and down, what I can do is actually pinpoint certain parts of the spinal cord. And if I were to sever those portions, what I get is a lack of information to either flow up or down. And we call those either ascending or descending tracts. So there's a whole bunch of names for them, and you can look at this and freak out. So we have ascending and descending. All of these just turn out to be pathways of sending information from one spot, one spot to another. The names typically actually kind of sort of make sense. So if you have like a cortical spinal, it's going from a cortex to somewhere where we happen to have information dealing with spinal cord. In this particular case, it's talking about the medulla. So the names actually tend to make sense. I'm not going to ask you to remember any of this stuff. I mean, if you become a neurologist, you're going to have to remember it. Or if you become a physical therapist, you're going to have to learn it. But not for this class. I don't know it. So I'd look it up. So how does information really move around? So we know how it can move up and down in ascending and descending tracks. But how do we get it into or out of the spinal cord? Well, what we happen to notice is people who tend to have posterior or dorsal damage to the spinal cord they tend to go numb or they have pain. They have sensory deprivations. People who damage the, pos or the anterior or the ventral portion of the spinal cord tend to have paralysis or movement issues. So the pattern that we tend to see is information flows into the dorsal portion of the spinal cord through what we would call the dorsal gray horn. And it's going to flow out of the spinal cord through the ventral gray horn where it will then lead to a muscle. So information flows into the dorsum or the dorsal side of the spinal cord and leaves through the ventral portion of the spinal cord. What we happen to notice is I can actually pinpoint where all these nerves turn out to be and where they're targeting. What you end up creating is a map called a dermatome, which we're going to be testing later on and seeing, you know, do things make sense and are you collecting information from the same spot and, 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 and. But we can turn out to use this to actually map. If you have problems with your skin, we can figure out where in the spinal cord things have gone wrong, which is kind of nice.